This morning's meditation is, Dear Father, open my eyes to your wisdom as I consider your creation. And that's taken from our daily bread. Please join me in the call to worship found in your bulletin. Give ear, O oh my people, to my teaching, incline your ears to the words of my mouth. I will open my mouth in a parable, I will utter dark sayings from old, things that we have heard and known, that our ancestors have told us. We will not hide them from their children. We will tell to the coming generation the glorious deeds of the Lord and his might and the wonders he has done. In the sight of their ancestors, he worked marvels in the land of Egypt, in the fields of Zoan. He divided the sea and let them pass through it and made the waters stand like a heap. In the daytime, he led them with a cloud, all night long with a fiery light. He split rocks open in the wilderness and gave them drink abundantly as from the deep. He made streams come out of the rock and caused waters to flow down like rivers. This morning's opening hymn is Glorious Things of Thee Are Spoken. And if you're comfortable and able, please stand. It's on page 267 in the red hymnal. Join me in the invocation and the Lord's Prayer found in your bulletin. Lord, Lord open, open our, our eyes to see, see the beauty in each person we meet. meet. Help, Help us freely share your love with all your creation. creation. We, we give thanks for beautifying your creation and for making a diverse world. world. Help us to be kind, compassionate, and loving to all. We thank you, O Lord, for allowing us to grow in our welcome and learn about other cultures. 
as we share your amazing grace and love with each other and the world. We pray as Jesus taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Glory be to the This morning's announcements are printed on the back of your bulletin. Uh, the flowers on the altar are given by Susan Sargent in memory of Albert Mokres. Thank you, Susan. Thank you. Beautiful memories. Uh, please sign up for host and coffee hour on the sheet in Fellowship Hall. Um, we, we have our Neighbors in Need collection. Um, and Reverend Greg might he might add more to that. He'll add more to that. Uh, so if, if you when you put your money in, I can we can collect it during the collection. Our Bible book study is continuing on Tuesdays, and October third we'll be continuing to talk about the Psalms, and we're reading. 30, 51, 90, 107, 109, 118, 137, 138. Sounds like a lot, but they're, they're kind of small, so yeah. it's, not, it's all good. Uh, all are invited, um, so hope to see you there. Tuesday, 7 o'clock in the Fellowship Hall. We will be hosting the Old Colony Association Fall Meeting on Tuesday, October 17th. And after a very short business session, we will engage in a fun community building activity. Um, so I bet that will be good. We're collecting socks, as you see up on the left here, for people in need. And we'll be doing the final donation on that October 17th. Um, if you have any suggestions or concerns, please speak to a member of the Pastoral Advisory Committee, Betty O'Leary, Kathy Frazier, and Dick Moore. Um, Reverend Baker's blog can be found um, on his website, which is listed, and he's available on Fridays. For anyone who wishes to see him, he has his contact information here also, his cell phone and email. Are there any other announcements? Krista? On October the 17th, the Bible study that That's correct. This is taking the place of the Bible study. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Susan? One plus seven. Okay, the deacons will meet next Sunday after church. Okay. I think we're good then. Thank you. All right. 
I love this stole, but it, one of the things I have a problem with it is it often gets askew, so thrifting to one side or the other. So if you see me adjusting it over the course of the service today, that's why. Wanted to give a few updates on some of the uh, announcements today. I'll talk more about the Neighbors in Need offering when we get to the offering portion of the service. Um, the, for the uh, book and Bible study, um, the... the um, those numbers are a correction to what we may have talked about uh, on Tuesday, so go by what's in the bulletin today in terms of what, I, what needs to be read. Uh, in terms of what Krista mentioned, um, our last Tuesday for the Psalm study will be um, on October 10th. So we will then finish our study on the Psalms. We'll have that Tuesday that's for um, the Old Colony meeting. And then the subsequent uh, Tuesday, the 24th, we'll start a new study. All right. Uh, in terms of the actual meeting on uh, Tuesday the 17th, I uh, have some more information. Um, we're going to have a worship time here, uh, pretty brief, not dissimilar from the kind of worship that we do before our Soup and Scripture services. We're going to then vote on the association budget, which will not take very long. We'll then have a presentation on Mission Insight, which is a service that gives you uh, more detailed uh, demographic and um, you know, information about the people living in the community. So as we're trying to think about new ways to reach out to people and make connections, this is a tool that our congregation and many other congregations can use. And then, uh, then we'll break up into small groups so that we can sort of answer the question, why do we do what we do? Because what we do for our community is very important. And sometimes it's worth taking a moment to uh, think these things through, especially if it's going to be with a group of people from different congregations, because we each do things differently. And the conversations we have, I think, will be really uh, fruitful and, uh, and wonderful. So uh, in addition, um, yesterday, uh, Don and I went to a seminar, a, a workshop in New Bedford for a group called Music That Makes Community. And uh, I thought it was very, uh, very well done. And I had actually met the, uh, the gentleman who runs it before. And I had a really good time. It was very challenging in a lot of ways. Um, and I may not feel quite as comfortable in doing the sort of things that, that, that he does. But I think we're going to try to model some of that music where we sing without um, paper and try to learn things uh, just by hearing them uh, and by going back and forth with each other. I think we're going to try to model some of that music on the 17th meeting so we can show off not just uh, to this congregation but to the whole association if anyone was unable uh, to go to that. Don, anything you'd like to add? Um, just, yeah, that it was phenomenal. It was great to meet uh, people nationally, people from Washington, D.C. and yeah. other parts of the yeah. country. Um, I mean, it was sponsored by the Old Colony Association, but it drew people from all over the place. Yeah. 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 So. so, it was very good. Yep. So um, again, that was something I had been mentioning. Um, one more thing about the 17th is that the call to the meeting finally went out uh, this past week, and I noticed that there wasn't a whole lot of information about the sock drive. So we may be in a place where, um, where we may be very far ahead of everybody else. So hope, I want to thank everybody who's been so generous, and I hope that we can maintain uh, that level of, of excellence when it comes to our generosity. If there are no other announcements, let us now move on to our time of joys and concerns. We have our continued prayers today for Leon Cudworth Sr., for Anne Marie Allen, for Dick Field, for Tiff and for Kim Vonica, for Susan Lemos, for Eunice, for Mary, for Millie Moore, for Pat Gonsalves, for Nick Riccardi, for Bethany Costa, for Bobby Files, for Tony Ribello, for Franklin McMullen and for David Rizuski. Are there any other uh, prayer updates or prayer requests this morning? Yes. I'm not going to run the number of the church, mm -hmm. but um, I'd like to say that I called my pastor mm -hmm. in Pennsylvania, and every Sunday we pray for different churches. <coughs> and um, this Sunday we are praying for this church. Mm -hmm. Um, so I think that is such a blessing, and I like to put um, our church um, in prayer, which um, 
of our churches, United Methodist Church, uh, it's Bethany United Methodist Church, and Red Lion, so that's my church family. Oh. And, um, I'm sorry. Where is the location again? The cars are moving oh, fast. It's Red Lion, Pennsylvania. Red Lion? Mm -hmm. Thanks. Uh, you, you were saying? And also, um, for my uh, brother in law, mm -hmm. um, Dennis Peter, he's just going through some testing and things like that. So I'll be here for quite a while. So I'll be pestering you all here. <laughs> Well, we appreciate your presence, and we appreciate the, our ability to help uh, pray for Dennis in his time of difficulty. So well, thank you. I love this church. Um, my family's been a member um, before, mm -hmm. so every time I come to visit, I love coming here. It's well, such a great church family. Oh, thank you very much. Mary, you had a prayer? Yes. Um, a young couple, well, young for me, uh, went on vacation, and we had a family that was in Mexico. Oh. Oh. His wife really didn't know like what to do at that point. Her parents were on a cruise in Canada and she couldn't get a hold of them. Oh wow. His mother and father, his mother's passport had expired, so she couldn't go be with her. The father had a trap, he doesn't even have a passport, so she was there struggling and just passed for the family. Okay. And did they have a, did, do you want to share the name or just the this particular family? Excuse me? Mike Korea Jr. Mike Korea Jr., okay. Thank you. So prayers for uh, Mike and his uh, passing and for all of the travel difficulties associated with uh, trying to, uh, to um, be together. Yeah, Leon? In fact, one may argue that one of the reasons that we're able to, to feel so safe is because we have those, those good first responders. So uh, definitely appreciate that. And I'm glad that um, that situation was not as bad as it could have been. Any other prayer requests this morning? All right. Then let us pray all together. Holy One. We ask that you continue to mold us into your likeness. We ask that your Holy Spirit move us into being kind, compassionate, and generous as we live out our faith daily. We pray for those who are hurting on the margins, excluded, lonely, and dealing with rejection and unacceptance by society. May each person know you love them and accept and value them as your precious creations. We pray for all those in our community who are caregivers, first responders, and those who advocate for the well-being of your people. We pray for our police and firefighters, medical personnel, and all who care for us in many ways. Watch over them and protect them from harm. We thank all who care for us and keep us safe each day. We lift in prayer our leaders that they may know wisdom and compassion and for all our partners across the world seeking to achieve justice for all. On this World Communion Sunday, we lift all the beautiful diversity of your people in prayer that they may all know your presence, grace, and infinite love for them. Shower them with your blessings and may the church become a safe place for all your people to gather. We bring, ask for blessings especially upon Bethany United Methodist Church in Red Lion, Pennsylvania, as they pray in blessing for us this World Communion Sunday. Help us, O oh God, to strive for unity and harmony and for a more just world. We pray for the hurting, those facing health problems, loss, and unsolvable problems. 
We pray especially for Leon and Anne-Marie, for Dick and for Tiff and for Kim, for Susan, for Eunice, for Mary, for Millie, for Pat and for Nick, for Bethany, for Bobby, for Tony, for Franklin, for David, for Dennis, for the family of Mike. We have so many other prayers that are left unnamed. And so we ask that you hear the silent prayers of our hearts and open those hearts as we listen to your word for us. Holy One, we ask that you help us become the beloved community you want us to be. We ask your forgiveness when we neglect our calling to be your hands, heart, and body. May your actions indeed honor and glorify you. Into your hands, Holy One, we commend all for whom we pray. In the name above all names, Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. This is the part in the service where I ask you to interact with me a little more than usual. So I wanted you to raise your hand if you've ever been hungry before. Raise your hand. Okay, good. All right. Uh, now raise your hand if you're hungry right now. All right, a couple of people, great. So I have some good news for you. We're gonna have a big, big important meal in a few minutes. Uh, we're gonna have communion, all right? So now, the food that we eat for communion, is that going to satisfy the hunger in our bellies? No, yeah, see Pat shaking her head, yeah. So it's not. We're going to get a little piece of bread, we're going to get a little sip of, of grape juice, and that's not going to really satisfy our caloric needs for the day. But it does fulfill some of the other needs we have. And that's because... Church is not just for people that are hungry for food, although it is for that, and it is our job to try to find ways to help feed our communities. But it's also for people who are hungry for meaning in their lives. And when we take our communion, we are remembering the life and sacrifice and resurrection of Jesus Christ and how that remembrance moves us to more love for God and more love for each other. On World Communion Sunday, we remember that when we take that little piece of bread and that little drink of grape juice, we are connected with so many other Christians around the world. Maybe they have wafers. Maybe they drink wine. Maybe they dip into a chalice. Maybe they come forward to be served. Maybe a deacon comes out to serve them. Maybe they live in a place where wheat and grapes are not readily available, and they have to make do with what they have. But wherever they gather, two or three, and they remember the life of Jesus, their souls are fed, and they find meaning. So let us now, when we are fed, by our communion meal, by the word of the Bible, by our fellowship together, let us then be fed so that we may be strong enough to help love and serve the world. Now, will you please repeat after me? Dear Lord, Dear Lord thank you for loving me. Thank you for feeding me. Help me to be hungry for love and kindness and safety that I may make the world a better place. Amen. All right, so everybody see these neighbors in need envelopes? All right. So we take these collections for neighbors in need every year. I'm very proud of that fact, by the way. Uh, does anyone remember exactly what neighbors in need is and does and how it differs from the other offerings that we take for the United Church of Christ over the course of the year? Anybody want to volunteer? Anybody a brave soul? 
Anybody remembers what I wrote in the newsletter that got sent out a few days ago? All right. So Neighbors in Need is a uh, offering that is done to the United Church of Christ, which goes to a number, a lot of the money goes to create grants for churches that are trying to do special projects. Um, and Neighbors in Need specifically goes to questions of justice and, uh, and, uh, and uh, work around justice issues in the United States. About a third of the offering also goes to uh, Native American ministries, and that uh, collection has been going on for quite some time. So I wanted to share with you uh, briefly a story about one of the things that a church has been doing through these kind of funds. And it says here that a United Church of Christ sanctuary church uh, offering immigrants refuge in the Arizona borderlands will soon be offering a place of hospitality, support, and hope on the Mexican side of the border for people who find themselves deported from the United States. The Shadow Rock UCC Sanctuary Action Team and the Reverend Ken Heinzelman uh, in an extension of the spirit and intent of their ministry of sanctuary in Phoenix are in the process of establishing the Hope Station Nogales in Sonora, Mexico. The thought is Hope Station, which was founded in part by a $10,000 grant from Neighbors in Need, can be a place of transition, a place where people who are deported but have family in the United States can find a meal, safe lodging, and assistance. There's people in need, there's an idea, and then we find money to make that call to justice, that call to mercy, that call to love a reality. So I hope that you will be generous in your gifts to neighbors in need this year. And so now, God, we open our hearts to give generous of the abundant blessings that we have received from you. All that we have comes from you, and therefore we give our offerings and our pledges in gratitude for all you have done for us. This morning's offering will now be received.
Let us pray. Holy One, we ask that you bless these offerings and pledges so they can multiply and be a blessing for our community, our mission, and our world. Accept our offerings and pledges, God, as a testimony of your goodness in our lives. Amen. Our hymn of preparation this morning can be found in the Black New Century Hymnal, and it is number 537, Christian, Rise and Act Your Creed. You're already ri you've already risen, so it's time to act your creed, and we're going to do that by singing all together. Good morning. Uh, this morning's Old Testament lesson is from Exodus 17, 1 through 7, and it's on page 58 in your Pew Bible. Water from the rock. From the wilderness of sin, the whole congregation of the Israelites journeyed by stages. As the Lord commanded, they camped at Rephidim, but there was no water for the people to drink. The people quarreled with Moses and said, Give us water to drink. Moses said to them, Why do you quarrel with, with me? Why do you test the Lord? But the people thirsted there for water. Moses and Moses and Excuse me. And the people complained against Moses and said, Why did you bring us out of Egypt to kill us and our children and livestock with thirst? So Moses cried out to the Lord, What shall I do with these people? The Lord said to Moses, Go on ahead of the people and take some of the elders of Israel with you. Take in your hand the staff with which you struck the Nile and go. I will be standing there in front of you on the rock of Horeb. Strike the rock and water will come out of it so that the people may drink. Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel. He called the place Massah and Meribah because the Israelites quarreled and tested the Lord saying, is the Lord among us or not? The gospel lesson is from the book of Matthew, and it's from chapter 21, verses 23 to 32, and it's on pages 721 and 722 in your Pew Bible. Mm -hmm. 
when he entered the temple, the chief priests and the elders of the people came to him as he was teaching and said, by what authority are you doing these things? And who gave you this authority? Jesus said to them, I will also ask you one question. If you tell me the answer, then I will also tell you by what authority I do these things. Did the baptism of John come from heaven or was it of human origin? And they argued with one another. If we say from heaven, he will say to us, why then did you not believe him? But if we say of human origin, we are afraid of the crowd, for all regard John as a prophet. So they answered Jesus, we do not know. And he said to them, neither will I tell you by what authority I am doing these things. And it continues to, uh, what do you think? Uh, a man had two sons. He went to the first and said, son, go and work in the vineyard today. He answered, I will not. But later he changed his mind and went. The father went to the second and said the same, and he answered, I will go, sir. But he did not go. Which of the two did the will of his father? They said, the first, Jesus said to them. Truly, I tell you, the tax collectors and the prostitutes are going into the kingdom of God ahead of you. For John came to you in the way of righteousness, and you did not believe him. But the tax collectors and the prostitutes believed him. And even after you saw it, you did not change your minds and believe him. Here ends the reading. All right, everybody, it's time for a pop quiz. All right, don't tell me you're surprised. It says that this is what we're going to do right on the sign outside. It also says the name of the sermon. It says pop quiz. So we're going to do a pop quiz. However, it's going to be an open book pop quiz. So you can take out your Bibles, little red books right in the, in the pew there. And we're gonna, I'm going to ask you guys some questions. Now, what I could do is I could take those little blue books and hand out pencils and have everybody have to fill them out and then come back and see who got the best grade. But that's going to take too long. And I think it'd be much more fun if you all did it as a group. All right, so I'm going to ask you guys some questions. You have your Bibles in front of you, and let's see how many questions you can get right. All right, so first question. How many books are there in the standard Protestant Bible? That's the one that's right in front of you. Anybody know? All right, raise your hand so I can hear you. Or say it loud enough that I don't have to. All right, anybody? Yeah. 66, that's right. All right. What is the first book of the Bible? Genesis. Genesis. Okay, what's the last book in the Bible? Revelation. Revelation, right. Okay, so based on the word count in the original languages, not in English, but in the original languages, what is the longest book in the Bible? No, it's not 1 Thessalonians, but that's a good guess. Are right, any other quest any other guesses? Psalms? Psalms is a, good, is a good guess, but because Psalms is in poetry, it tends to seem longer by word than, not than the work, book I'm thinking about. But that, I think, is third. All right? Close, yes, it's Jeremiah. All right, Jeremiah has the most of words, so it's the longest book in the Bible. What is the shortest book in the Bible based on the number of words in the original language? There's, there's a lot of funny names, all right? I'll give you guys about a few more seconds to see if you can guess. Tabakook's a good guess. Obadiah is a very short book that's on the list. I think that's the shortest of the books maybe in the Old Testament, but there's one in the New Testament that's even shorter. Ezra? Not, not Ezra. This is maybe better than Ezra, I don't know. So, uh, what's that? It's not Philippians, but you're in the right neighborhood. It is, in fact, the third letter of John. All right? Who knew it was the third letter of John? Raise your hand. 
Who knew there was a third letter of John in the Bible? Raise your hand. All right, there you go. Good job, Leon. All right, so now let's talk, start talking about some biblical characters. All right, who is the tallest person in the Bible? All right, who's the tallest person in the Bible? Goliath. Goliath. It's not Goliath, actually. That's what everybody thinks, but it's actually a character called King Og. He's in the book of Numbers. And according to Deuteronomy, he's 13 and a half feet tall, which beats Goliath, who's at about nine feet, if you read it one way, and six and a half feet, if you read it another way. All right? He was, uh, Og was called the last of the giants, and he shows up every once in a while in a psalm or something like that. So who was the shortest person in the Bible? All right? That would be a character from the book of Job, uh, Bildad the Shuhite. He's only the size of a shoe. And who is the second shortest person in the Bible? That would be Nehemiah. Right, actually, those last two are jokes. That's not actually the answer. All right, so here's another pretty easy question. Who's the main character in Exodus? Right, who's the main character in Exodus? Moses, right, okay. So, why did the Israelites wander through the wilderness for 40 years? I mentioned this last week. All right, it wasn't because they didn't have GPS. All right, so why did they, why did they wander around for 40 years? No? It was punishment, that right. It was punishment for not believing, and because God felt that that generation who had come out of slavery would never believe in the right way, he waited, God waited for them to die off in the wilderness before that younger generation could then pass over the River Jordan into the Promised Land. All right, let's ask a question about the New Testament. Whose birthday do we celebrate on Christmas? Jesus, okay, you all know that one, good. If you didn't, know, if you didn't get that one, we'd be in some problem, trouble. Okay. So, who baptized Jesus? John the Baptist, okay. Who, what were the two groups whose members often opposed Jesus when he was preaching and teaching? The two groups, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, that's right. And Sadducees are also sometimes called the chief priests. All right. So I got two more questions, and then we'll be we'll move on to the rest of the sermon. Okay. So, what do you have to do to earn God's grace? What do you have to do to earn God's grace? What's that? You can't earn God's grace. That's right. It's nothing. It's a free gift. You you take advantage of that gift by believing. But you don't have to do anything to get the gift. It's a free gift from God. And last question, what are the three most important Christian values according to the Apostle Paul? Baptism and communion are sacraments. These are virtues. All right? You'll know it once I say it. That's a commandment, but it relates to that. It comes out of that commandment. The answer is faith, hope, and love. That's right. Okay. So you all get an A for effort. All right? Now, how many of you felt prepared when I said there was a pop quiz today? Anybody? Anybody read the sign and think I was actually being serious? All right. So how many felt stressed when I put you on the spot? Anyone feel stressed? Yep, okay. Uh, now, what if I had actually, instead of asking you to all you know, say it together, uh, if I had actually pointed to each as an individual and asked you a question, put you on the spot that way, how would you feel? That would be very stressful. That would be, and you'd feel very uncomfortable, right? Now, in life, does that happen sometimes? And I'm not talking about like a teacher pointing at you and asking a question. I'm just like you feeling overwhelmed and surprised by something that life was asking of you. You ever feel that way? All right, deaf, yes, last, yes. So life can feel like a series of tests, and it's a series of tests that we often feel that we're unprepared for, and we often feel like we're failing. There's something we're supposed to do, there's something that's being asked of us, and we can't do it the way that we think we need to do it. And so when we feel like we're being tested, when we are insecure, when we are afraid, and we think about God, we forget that we have sort of that open book 
in front of us. We have the Bible. We have each other to help us work out. And instead of recognizing the help that we're getting, we start trying to reverse the test. Instead of wanting to feel like God is testing us, we say, okay, well, we're going to test God back. And I think when you try to do this, you discover that you learn an awful lot about the per person trying to test God and a lot less about the God you're trying to test. Now, I want to tell you a story about my uh, best friend in high school uh, who, in his sophomoric way, when we would talk about religion, decided that he would test God by asking for a ham sandwich. May have told you this story before. So he said if God was real, then the divine could manifest a sandwich for him without difficulty because God can do anything. So God can definitely materialize a sandwich, right? You know, God materializes the man in the wilderness, right? Why not a sandwich for him? But if the sandwich did not appear when he prayed for the sandwich, then that must mean there's no God, right? That was his way of thinking. And does anyone feel that this was a mature or well-thought-out way of understanding how God and faith works? No. Okay, good. Again, good baseline to, to, to approach the question with. So, I think that my friend didn't understand that God is not a um, sort of a vending machine that just provides miracles on demand. God requires us to be in relationship. And I think he also failed to notice that many, many of the miracles that God was already providing, such as the times when he was hungry and his mother would make him a sandwich. Maybe that was a miracle. So, our Exodus story today, uh, it's another story of Moses uh, performing a life-saving miracle on behalf of God and the people testing God nonetheless. We talked a little bit about this last week when we had the story of the manna. But this time the Israelites make camp at a place called Rephidim, and when they get there, there's no water. So the people begin to blame Moses saying that he led them to their deaths, and they start quarreling with him. Give us water to drink. Why did you bring us out in the desert to die? They demand that Moses fix the problem right now. And they don't trust that God will provide a solution. Even though God has already solved problems like freeing them from slavery or feeding them in the wilderness. What the Israelites lack in this particular story, what they don't have and they fail that test is faith. Because they don't trust that Moses is a good leader and they don't trust that God is going to take care of them. Even though Moses and God have proven themselves to be trustworthy again and again. Moses tells God that the people are ready to stone him because he will not perform a miracle right then without God's permission. And so in a very God-like reversal, I think, God contrasts those stones that they want to throw at Moses and instead commands Moses to strike a great rock. And through striking the rock, having it open up and a spring of water appear so that all the people will have fresh water to drink. I see it's kind of like the cross. God takes a symbol of death and turns it into a symbol of life. Regardless, because of the people's lack of faith, this miraculous place is called Masa and Meribah, which in Hebrew mean test and quarrel, because the people did not believe that God was with them. We see another kind of test in our story today from the Gospel according to Matthew. This takes place during Jesus' last week in Jerusalem. And the day after Jesus overturns the tables in the temple, the chief priests and elders, that is the Sadducees, Ex demand an explanation. They say, by what authority are you doing these things? And who gave you this authority? Now, meanwhile, Jesus has been preaching and healing and transforming lives for a while now, and many believe specifically in his authority, even evil spirits. But these chief priests do not believe in Jesus' authority because it undermines their worldly control of things in Jerusalem. I think these priests fail their test because they lack hope. They believe in God. They believe in the idea of the Messiah, but they can't really imagine that God would help the world through a man like Jesus, a peasant from Galilee and not some great priest or king. So Jesus then turns the question about divine and human authority back on them. He asks whether the baptisms of John were from human or, or heavenly 
origin. And the priests think to themselves and say, well, if we say heavenly, then they'll look like fools for not believing and acting according to what John said. But if they say human, they're going to lose the support of all the people that do believe in John's baptism and whose lives have been transformed by that. And so they fail Jesus' pop quiz and they don't really say anything. I feel this is an interesting dilemma because many people will claim to have faith in God but don't really have hope that God is going to change things. Their God is very far away. Their God is someone who performed miracles thousands of years ago, but today just leaves things in the hands of people, the people that have the power to do the things that they feel that they want. And if God wants things to change, it's not going to happen, at least not for a very long time. So Jesus tells the Pharisees, a parable. And I think this is where we see that third test that I want to talk about. This is a story of a vineyard owner and his two sons, and he asked the boys to work in the field that day. And the first says no, but the second says yes. But then the first changes his mind and comes to work, but the second never shows up. He breaks his promise. And then Jesus asks the Sadducees, who did the will of his father? And they naturally say the first son. Because the lesson here is it doesn't matter what you say, it matters what you do. And that second son failed that test of charity or of active love. When Jesus tells this story, he's implicitly accusing the priests of being like that second son. They make a great show of praising God with their words, but do very little to make God's love felt in the world around them. On the other hand, the tax collectors and the prostitutes who seemingly flaunt God's laws end up coming to help people because they accepted John's baptism, because they have faith in Jesus. And the God who is with them, and who always gives them another chance to do the right thing. Now this particular parable is one that really sticks with me. Because sometimes I plan on doing something, and then I never quite get around to doing it. And this is maybe sometimes because I'm forgetful or because I'm procrastinating. But the result is, is that the world is not as good as it could be because I don't follow through on my promises. You know, I try not to make a habit out of this and I always vow to do better the next time. And I find that if I do prove over time, I feel like I am becoming more loving and am becoming more charitable towards others just like God wants me to be. And I think many people feel this way too. In the story, Jesus calls out the Sadducees and also the uh, Pharisees uh, as being hypocritical. You know, naturally, there are many Pharisees and Sadducees that were wonderful and kind and charitable and were Jesus' friends. But the ideology that was behind their, um, their groups could very easily turn to hypocrisy. And when they, and people saw how hypocritical uh, their leaders were, they didn't trust them anymore, and they turned away from God. As we celebrate World Communion Sunday, I think about how many Christians act like that second son, or like those priests. They make this grand show about showing how loving and faithful they are. You know, they may wear crosses or put bumper stickers on their cars, <clears throat> but often, not always, but often they're the first ones to make excuses, to not engage with the suffering that they see around them, or blame people for their own problems. <clears throat> they set limits on who deserves God's endless love and grace. Remember grace, the free gift? They put limits on that. On the other hand, many people from less civilized places, or people from different faiths, or people of no faith, they demonstrate their love and their charity to the people who are most in need. And so when we then claim that being a Christian is so important because it makes us such better people, it seems very hypocritical when Christians can be some of the least forgiving and the least charitable people in the face of the world's challenges. And so even if we pass the test of faith in God and the test in hope in God's kingdom, we fail the test of charity. If we don't reach out, and do what we can to help others and to put aside that now very well-known idea that Christians are just a bunch of hypocrites. Remember, Paul wrote, 
And now faith, hope, and love remain these three. And the greatest of these is love. All of these tests are important, but I feel like the uh, test of love is the final exam. Because again, in some ways, life is a series of tests. And often it is one for which we do feel unprepared. When we examine our lives in depth, we find that we do fall short of God's expectations. But there's one more trick. God wants us to succeed. It's why through God's grace, we end up passing the course that is life, even if we fail a test from time to time. Now, that doesn't mean we should then just coast through life, because life is an opportunity to learn and to share our successes and failures with others. The world is better when we pass all of our tests, even the surprising ones, and we find happiness and joy through the effort that we make to rise to the challenges in our lives. So let us listen to Jesus, our great teacher, and let's go out and try our best to find faith, hope, and charity in the world around us. Let us pray. Dear Jesus, teach us to be more faithful, hopeful, and loving in all we do. As we pray in your most holy name. Amen. Our communion hymn this morning is from the Black New Century Hymnal. It is number 338. It is called Sheaves of Summer. Uh, it is originally in Spanish. Uh, the name there is Una Espiga. Uh, however, I am very bad at singing Spanish, so we're going to sing it in English. This may be uh, a bit of an unknown hymn to you, so I'm going to ask that Cheryl please play it through all the way through, and then uh, we'll sing together. If you just want to listen with me for the first verse, that's okay too. So let us listen, and then let's all rise and sing together. And to share in the community of God's people. God be with you. Lift up your hearts. And let us give thanks to God most high. For it is right to give God thanks and praise. Let us pray. We give you thanks, God of majesty and mercy, for calling forth the creation and raising us from dust by the breath of your being. We bless you for the beauty and bounty of the earth and for the vision of the day when sharing by all will mean scarcity for none. 
We remember the covenant you made with your people Israel. And we give you thanks for all our ancestors in faith. We rejoice that you call us to reconciliation with you and all people everywhere. And that you remain faithful to your covenant even when we are faithless. We rejoice that you call the entire human family to this table of sacrifice and victory. We come in remembrance and celebration of the gift of Jesus Christ, whom you sent in the fullness of time to be the good news. Lord of Mary, our sister in faith, Christ lived among us to reveal the mystery of your word, to suffer and die on the cross for us, to be raised from death on the third day, and then to live in glory. We bless you, gracious God, for the presence of your Holy Spirit in the church you have gathered. With your sons and daughters of faith in all places and times, we praise you with joy, singing, Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of love and majesty, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And so we remember that on the night of betrayal and desertion, Jesus took the bread gave you thanks, broke the bread, and gave it to the disciples, saying, This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, Jesus took also the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink of it in remembrance of me. Therefore, we are bold to proclaim the mystery of our faith. Christ has died, Christ is risen, and Christ will come again. Eternal God, we spread your table with these gifts of the earth and of our labor. We present to you our very lives, committed to your service on behalf of all people. We ask you to send your Holy Spirit on this bread and cup, and on our gifts and on us. Strengthen your universal church, that it may become the champion of peace and justice in the world. Restore the earth with your grace, which is able to make all things new. Amen. Through the broken bread, we participate in the body of Christ. Through the cup of blessing, we participate in the new life Christ brings.
The cup of salvation. Take and drink. And now let us pray. Eternal God, you have called your people from east and west and north and south to eat at the table of Jesus Christ. We thank you for Christ's presence, for the spiritual food of Christ's body and blood. By the power of your Holy Spirit, keep us faithful to your will. Go with us to the streets, to our homes, to our places of labor and leisure, that we may gather, that, when we, that whether we are gathered or we are scattered, we may be the servant church of the servant Christ, in whose name we pray and rejoice. Amen. Our closing hymn to get, uh, today is from the Black New Century Hymnal. It is number 45, and it is called Christ is the Mountain of Horror. This is a uh, song from Puerto Rico, uh, Cristo es la Peña de Hora, which, again, I'm not great at pronouncing Spanish. If you are, feel, please feel free to sing in Spanish. But, um, again, this is a song you may not be quite as familiar with, and so uh, please uh, let us listen as Cheryl plays the thing all the way through once, and then let us rise and all sing together. Share that faith and hope and love as you serve all God's people. Amen.